and welcome to my channel, I'm Fornax and today we continue our Path of Fire Act 1 review. In part 1 we looked at Sparking the Flame, there is a link in the top right hand corner of the screen for anyone who missed that. Here in part 2 we will talk about the next chapter, Blazing a Trail. Now needless to say there are story spoilers ahead, so if you have not played through this episode, please jump ship now. But do come back, because I want to know your thoughts in the comments below, some of which will be featured in the next episode of this series. Speaking of which, it's time to share your thoughts about the start of the expansion. Now there are timestamps in the pinned comment below, so you can jump to the comment you're interested in, or you can skip this section and dive straight into my commentary on Blazing a Trail. So we are starting with GRM Adrian, who was kind enough to comment on this video. If you do not know him, he is a content creator covering Guild Wars 2, World of Warcraft, Neverwinter, Black Desert Online, and much, much more. There is a link to his channel below, and I highly recommend checking out this lovely chap's brilliant work. On to his comment. Adrian says, This is an amazing review. Well, thank you very much. Looking forward to the next part. Let's hope that it lives up to your expectations. I also totally agree with your feelings about Timey. Her presence, I felt, was sorely missed in some parts of the expansion because of how dark the tone got much further in. But those little catch-up calls and interactions between her and my commander never failed to lighten the mood and were memorable. I would also love to see more of the dwarves, being a relatively new player to the world of Guild Wars 2 and having not played through Guild Wars, the original campaigns. I still don't know much about their race, except through story snippets about how they've fallen into decline. A bit more content that explores this would make me really happy. On a final note, again, I agree about the mounts in Guild Wars 2, by far the most satisfying mount system in any MMORPG I've played, not only because they're fun and move well, but because of how useful they are and how the content makes them a part of the game world. Anyway, keep up the great work and look forward to the next vid. Thank you so much for the love and the comment. On to Robert Boosey, who wrote, I went into the Path of Fire expansion with my RPS mentality and the story absolutely delivered from the start. It thrust our character into the fray, into a land we knew little about since the first game's story, and let us discover it and how it had changed over the centuries, and I loved it. It'll be a while until I go with another playthrough but only because I want to forget enough of it to get a bit of the initial excitement again. Thank you so much, Robert, for commenting. I love hearing from our peers like myself, and I totally agree, it was a great start to Path of Fire. Oliver de Vega wrote, From the beginning of Path of Fire, you can sense the increase of quality that developers have acquired on presenting the story. If you compare it to Heart of Thorns, which had a pretty predictable start, Path of Fire, on the other hand, those interesting conversations to you from the first moment. I loved to talk with Ogden again as well. After that, we engage in a much more mature story, trying to fight a foe, the Herald, not me, <laughs> to be clear, who we couldn't defeat by just pressing our one ability. The way they made us battle her several times, forging a kind of relationship before moving on to the next thing, just as they did later with Balthasar, was brilliant. Thank you, Oliver, for commenting, and I do agree, it was a much more engaging, much more involved story, with more challenging foes, especially our encounters with Balthasar going forward. Um, were some of the most enjoyable and frustrating moments in the game for me. I quite agree. Thank you so much. On to Ada's comment. Now, Ada is 
a good friend of mine in game. We chat almost every day. She is also a patron of mine, so I'm very grateful for her support. And this lady is the captain and one of the driving forces behind the Crichton Herald Guild. So her comment is, my low was the achievement of yelling at the temple to get everyone to run away from the Herald. In fairness, when we were playing through that, I completely messed up the achievement, so that might be a reference to that, and I'm still sorry. I'm like, it was stressful. I panicked. And her high point, she says, was picking Joko. Praise Joko. Now, I do worry that Ada has a borderline obsession with Joko, and there has even been some talk about building some kind of shrine to him in the guild hold. I'm kind of worried where this is leading, but I guess that's another story for another day. Now, Ada also is a content creator herself. She has a burgeoning YouTube channel where she spends her time promoting and helping content creators like me. She has a massive list of um, wooden potatoes competition YouTube entries for people to peruse. She's uh, a brilliant supporter of this community. Do please show her channel some love. On to Speedy Eye, who wrote, I'm trying to describe this expansion, but I'm lost for words in its whole, the mounts, the storyline, the visuals of the environment, all the mods, Everything, I mean everything in this expansion, is breathtakingly amazing. That's all I can get out, because words can't really describe it. Path of Fire is just a thing that needs to be discovered. It's a pure and simply stunning piece of art. Epic is a tiny start for all the words needed to describe this masterpiece. I quite agree. It's a very good expansion. Zippo the Third. I'm going to say Zippo the third because I don't know what to do with all those eyes, <laughs> wrote, I'm kind of missing Bram. What happened to him after a crack in the ice? Did he become a dragon hunter? I need to know. If you've played through the, um, the first installment of season four, you won't be disappointed with that in this respect. I'm trying to not give spoilers away. Poor Bram. I know that he has annoyed quite a a hefty swathe of the player base with his sullen, grumpy ass hattery. But coming from a place of a storyteller and having experienced the loss of a parent, I know that it can do terrible things to you. It's hard to convey that kind of real world emotion in the context and the confinements of a video game. When you lose a parent, it's like the whole world is suddenly a different place. It's smaller, colder, and yet bigger and more terrifying at the same time. It's a very strange, uh, a very strange, a very sad, and very, very life altering experience. And any kind of loss can change a personality and people go off the rails. There's a very good reason they say that if you ever have a major loss in your life, don't do anything. Don't sell your house, don't get divorced, don't get married, don't do anything that's life altering for at least the first 12 to 18 months. There is a very good reason they say that because this kind of loss can knock you sideways, tilt the axis of your world, spin you off into a direction for a time that is not really representational of who you are as a person. And, and it, it can take a while to find your way back to, to normality, to stability. So I have a little bit more compassion for Bram having had that real world experience of losing my parent. And back on topic with the dragon hunter aspect of Bram and as Bo and this kind of thing. I would love to see them retrofit this. We have much more grounded elite specializations with Path of Fire and I love it that the law is based in the world and you can see it and you can interact with characters with the new elite specializations and I'm very happy if they would try to retrofit this into the new story for the old specializations. It needs to be somewhere, I think. So yes, fingers crossed. 
Violet Bliss wrote, I am with you on the chair cars. Nice video, thank you. Completely forgot to add my opinion of the early story with the overriding of the chairs and I quite enjoyed it. The visuals are just amazing to wander around in. They picked a great moment and a location to set the tone, I think. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, we need the chairs. We need to be able to sit in a chair. Now, I'm not saying that everyone needs to be able to sit in a chair, and I don't want to be racist against the char, but, you know, we could just reserve sofas for them. They're rather big. None could make the excuse that they might break furniture, because they're rather big boned. But no, we need, we need to be able to sit in chairs. The story was great. We need the chairs. Nicholas McDermott wrote, I love the opening act of Path of Fire. Getting to see Ogden again was awesome, even though it was for a short time. Yeah, yeah, we need Ogden. We do. The more Ogden, the better. Actually, when I was doing some research and listening to the different soundtracks for my last video about um, the top 10 sort of soundtrack to my adventures through Guild Wars from the early campaigns to now, Ogden's theme is actually beautiful. You should really check that out. Anyway, I digress. Now, on to Cossage. Now, Cossage wrote his own version of War and Peace for this. It's a long, detailed, and brilliant breakdown of the story. Now, I'm going to read you a, a small extract of it here, yeah, but I really recommend that you pop back and read through his comment. He should really make a video around it. <laughs> anyway, here is his comment. The humour in the prologue and the actual sparking the flame instance was spot on for me. Keel's face palm at Timey's sudden vocal reveal was priceless, as was the commander's interactions with the always funny Farron. Cameos from Magnus Ogden and Turma were welcome, not to forget the return of first mate Phidias Fokrush from season one. What this showed is that ArenaNet hasn't forgotten their less used characters and will implement them into the narrative when the time is right, and that I can always appreciate. A good story needs tension, it needs action, but it also needs humour and it needs light moments. All tension is too much, you stress people out, not enough action, people lose interest. I also think that they need to do fan service for people who play through season one, fan service for people who play through the original campaigns, but also offering something new to new players as well. So yeah, it's a it's a difficult task to try and please everybody, to try and put nuggets for everybody, but I think that they did remarkably well and it speaks volumes to what hopefully we're going to get in the future. Now, sorry if your comment was not included here today. Please know I have read them all, and by the time this episode airs, I will have replied to all the comments made on the original video. So even if I have not been able to share your comment here because of time constraints, they were appreciated and read. Honestly, the fact that you took the time to share your thoughts, ideas, and experiences with me means the world to me. Thank you so very much. Let's jump into the story review. Blazing a Trail is not as exciting as the title might seem to suggest, which is actually not a bad thing. If every instalment of the story was hair on fire, heart-stopping action, we would miss the big moments, the iconic battles would be lost in the haze of war. Like any good story, tension must be built and spent only to be built again. The episode begins with us being directed by Captain Rahim to various NPCs in and around Amnoon. As we are able to progress through the story steps of this installment in any order we wish, my first stop was the deputy outside the Grand Sahel Casino. After threatening this would-be turncoat for information, I headed into the casino itself. 
awaiting me inside my personal story instance was Zalambo, the owner of the establishment. This character's charisma is in no small way due to the brilliant voice acting of E.K. Amadi. If you are not familiar with his work, he is a veteran video game voice actor, and Zallenberg even bears a striking resemblance to the handsome Mr. Amadi himself. But I digress. Despite Zalenberg's obvious charm, we are left in no doubt that this man is a ruthless operator, and our character is cut and tight-lipped in his presence. Before we can persuade Zalenberg to our cause, Icon Aberu of the Mordant Crescent arrives. He is here to punish Zalenberg for his resistance to the rule of Polara Joko, and we are forced to intercede, saving Zalenberg his casino, and its denizens from Joko's Awakened. Now in our debt, Zalenburg reluctantly offers his assistance, gathering intelligence on Balthazar and his forged army. I would like to point out that there is one particularly interesting rumour about Zalenburg, which could hint at this character's future story progression. Now to be clear, I have no, zero, none whatsoever, foreknowledge of the story to come. But if he is indeed a jinn, this could lead to some interesting story tangents to say the least. Now I only mention this because in writing, when details are mentioned, specifics like this, they usually have purpose. If it's not needed, it's cut. If it's needed, it's kept. That's generally the rule of thumb, but, 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 that is not always the case when stories are translated in the gaming universe. And now, I did enjoy these initial encounters. My character seems to be evolving, or perhaps devolving, into a rather ruthless leader. This could be both good and bad. Strength, conviction and determination are needed when meeting any real challenge, but there is a fine line between strength in action and brutality. Given the current situation, perhaps it matters not that we could lose ourselves, sacrificing our virtue for the greater good. Flawed and fallen heroes are far more interesting than choir boys. Well, at least to me. Now, the next part of the story had me in a meeting with Chief Counselor Iman. She is seeking our counsel in determining the alignment of Amnoon. Ritlock and Kazmir are here to offer some advice and guidance of their own. I love that they have voice acted the lion's share of character dialogue here. It helps immersion greatly, and it's attention to detail like this that makes Path of Fire storytelling so polished and enjoyable. That said, yeah, this for me was one of the weakest moments of the story because it seems so very out of place. If the Counselor Iman had sought our guidance at the end of the narrative, I could understand her motives. We would have proven our worth by then. But at this point in the story, we are a stranger to her. She knows only the lip surface paid to our character by others who themselves are strangers to her. Now, at this point, we have freed a small village, which is a noble enough undertaking and if she had offered our character thanks and aid, that would have been understandable. But asking us to determine the fate of a city we have only just arrived in, that we have no knowledge of, history, it's ludicrous and it's almost meaningless at this point. Because what do we really know about the Sunspears? Or Palawa Joko? or even Amnoon itself. This story step should have occurred closer to the end, when we could have made an informed and therefore meaningful choice, having encountered and gained first-hand knowledge of the factions we are asked to choose from. I think having this early was seemingly to facilitate a collection process in relation to the backpacks that we unlock, and I think it was misguided. I will say, however, that the choice to have us 
interact with NPCs at the refugee camp, which is the next step of the story, was a brilliant piece of narrative gameplay. Having to help these poor people to hear their stories was touching and thought-provoking, especially in the current global situation. And this story step was the first place we hear about Glint the Dragon Prophet's first scion, Blast. I was honestly quite giddy when I first heard this. His fate amongst veterans of the original campaigns has always been a topic of great interest and speculation, so I was all on board for this. The conclusion of Blazing a Trail finds us back inside Zalimbul's casino. Whitlock and Kazmir are awaiting us inside, as well as Kanak. Now, I love this grumpy old salad. He is one of my favourite characters, and any time I get to listen to his sarcastic and sullen monologues, well, that's a win for me. His weakness for gambling only endeared him to me more. Now, Kanak was invited to join Dragon's Watch by the commander, but he seemingly declined more or less, in Season 3's episode, Confessor's End, so his appearance in the story here was a brilliant surprise. Aside from Taimi, interactions with the other members of Dragon's Watch have been tense and emotionally driven since Season 3, and he offers some very welcome relief from that dynamic for me. Anyway, back to the story, and Zellenberg has proven to be as resourceful as his reputation suggested. He informs us that Balthazar is not hunting Krag Toric, as we feared, but Flast. Armed with this and a new sense of purpose and direction, the party opts to split up and investigate the forge camps in the area as Casimir heads to the Temple of Cormier. They must discover why Balthazar is hunting Vlast before it's too late. Blazing a Trail was an interesting and engaging establishing episode. It moved the story forwards slowly as we acclimatised to the new location and situation we found ourselves in. The city of Amnoon and its denizens are well-rounded and diverse, and it made the story feel alive. Please let me know your thoughts on Blazing a Trail down below. I will feature some of your comments at the start of the next instalment of this series, where we will be jumping into Night of Fires. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, comment and share. I want to thank my brilliant patrons, without whom I could not create the volume of content that I do. Their support, dedication and kindness means the world to me. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch my videos, to make comments, to like, to share. My subscribers and my patrons make this work possible, and I can't thank you all enough. If you feel inspired to jump in and try Guild Wars 2, there are referral links below to the free-to-play game, the Heart of Thorns expansion, and the Path of Fire expansion too. Thanks to the generosity of ArenaNet, these referrals directly support my channel. I hope you join me next time, and as always, thanks for watching.